depending on where you're joining us from uh, around the world. My name is uh, Julio and I'm the head of strategic innovation unit uh, at UNDP. Um, welcome to what is the first of a mini series um, that we're going to devote to the topic of uh, data governance. Today is the first session in this series. Tomorrow we have a follow-up session. So I hope you signed up for that one as well. Uh, and uh, from our perspective, uh, we thought that it would be an extremely timely moment to host a conversation around uh, uh, data governance right now. Uh, the reason being that uh, uh, COVID uh, has put once more to the fore uh, a very, and sometimes in very dramatic ways, uh, both opportunities and the limitations uh, with our current data infrastructure, data governance model, uh, and uh, data systems. And at least personally, uh, I find that uh, in many different ways, uh, we are still struggling very much to find uh, mental frameworks, metaphors, and uh, the vocabulary to talk about an issue like data, which is on one hand uh, very abstract, but at the same time has extremely practical and sometimes fairly dramatic consequences on, on the lives of people. Now, luckily we have uh, with us a formidable panel who is going to help us unpack uh, all of this complexity and uh, point us in the direction where we might want to go to start looking for uh, answers to some of the questions that uh, we all have in this uh, area. Uh, I should mention that this uh, uh, a series is brought uh, uh, to us in collaboration with two organizations that have uh, a strong relationship with NDP when it comes to innovation. One is uh, the Slovak uh, Ministry of Finance who has been for long supporting the work of uh, uh, UNDP on innovation. And the other one is the Rockefeller Foundation uh, with which uh, out of Asia Pacific, we have a partnership that is very much focusing on issues related around uh, data, building data ecosystems and uh, uh, exploring the lessons that are emerging from practice. So with this, I think it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our panel and we'll start straight from someone who joins us from uh, Rockefeller Foundation itself is Kevin O'Neill, is the Director of uh, uh, Data and Technology. Uh, together with us uh, tonight, we also have uh, Jessica Montgomery, who is the Executive Director of the Accelerate Program for Scientific Discovery at the University of Cambridge. She's also the Director of the Data Trusts Initiative. Uh, and then we have uh, Sushant Kumar, who is a Principal of Responsible Technology of your media network. Uh, so just by, uh, you have all the bios, but just by seeing uh, the organization that we're coming from and the type of work that they do, you can already imagine that they will probably be the best possible candidates we can imagine to help us unpack questions related to data governance. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll pass on the word to Kevin, who's going to set the scene for us in terms of why are, is it uh, an important moment to start looking at data governance? What are the things that we're seeing that are working? What is not working? What are some of the questions that should be asking? And then setting the scene on for, for the rest of the conversation. Over to you, Kevin. Thanks a lot, Julio. And um, thanks a lot to the UNDP team uh, to the Slovak government and uh, to my colleagues uh, in RF's Asia Pacific office, uh, especially Priyanka Karani for organizing this. Um, this couldn't come at a better time. Um, we, we at the Rockefeller Foundation, like a lot of the organizations in the room today, are really committed to using data and using data for good and using data more. So we're unapologetic uh, data boosters. But at the same time, we all have to acknowledge that if we're going to use data well, we have to use it responsibly um, as well as effectively. Um, and that's essentially what governance is about. Um, when I was first delving into this issue, someone explained it to me. Um, if you wanna build a really fast car, a Porsche, um, you don't just focus on the engine, you also think about the steering, you think about the brakes, so you can go fast, but in a controlled manner. 
And that fundamentally is what we're talking about and what we're trying to do here. Um, so if we, uh, you know, to set the stage a little bit, uh, data governance isn't a new thing. It's certainly been around and discussed since the 1940s, and it's probably been around and discussed since long, at least since there were modern censuses, and perhaps back to uh, the BC area era when government started doing censuses in, uh, in ancient Babylon. Um, so, but something has changed, and there have been some things that have changed. Um, and what's really different now is we're now in an era where data is um, being produced by and used by machines um, at a pace that really uh, humans can't um, completely keep up with. Um, and there's four implications of this. Um, one is that data collection is more frequent and it's more pervasive. Whereas, uh, you know, in my grandfather or even my father's era, um, data might have been, uh, you know, first embodied in the family, would have known about the family's business, the village or town might have known, and then the government might have come around every 10 years for a census or, um, or maybe collected some data yearly for a, um, uh, to collect taxes. Um, but now, of course, as we all know, our phones are collecting data on us, closed circuit uh, computer uh, cameras are collecting data on, on us, and every time we go through a financial tra transaction, even buying something, we're generating data. Um, the second thing has changed is that analysis has got, gotten highly specific. If you think about the census era, um, we would want to say things about a village at most, or maybe the, the state, and we would have been able to say them uh, you know, each, uh, at best each year, maybe even 10 years. Um, but now there's data analysis done on what I'm thinking, what I'm doing right now. Um, and there are products being offered to me based on um, those actions and uh, the signals that I'm giving off as I move through the web, as I go through my daily uh, routines. Um, the third thing is there's been a shift in who collects and controls data. It used to be, again, the family or the government. Um, uh, then academics and nonprofits began collecting data, but in the last few years, the majority of the data and the richest data has been collected um, primarily by private and for-profit ent entities. Um, and that has a fourth implication, which is uh, as data has assumed greater economic and political power, the question of who controls data, who has access for data, and even what problems data is collected about has taken on greater and greater importance. So if we want, a, we want societies where the right problems are addressed and the right people are in charge, we need to think about how we govern data. Um, so there are two um, implication challenges that I think we need to think about in, um, in managing governance for data. One is that data gets its power as a collective. One data point, my data actually isn't all that valuable. Um, so as we think about development applications, for example, one thing that we're thinking about is um, uh, the use of photos to diagnose crop diseases. Um, if I just take a picture of my plant and upload it, that doesn't do anyone a whole lot of good. It has to be compared against thousands um, of other photos of crops in order to create a useful diagnostic algorithm. It gets even more useful if my signal that I've uploaded um, uh, is used to create, say, an alert for my neighbor to say, hey, there's a pest in the neighborhood. You need to act. So data is something that gets more useful as it gets more collective. But at the same time, um, th that creates risk. If I upload my, my photo, will my neighbors shun me? Will they not buy my products, et cetera? Um, so we need to think about both those individual and that collective use of data. Uh, the second one is um, that we have to balance personal, private, and public interests. All of these are legitimate um, and uh, they need to be both resolved and uh, balanced. Uh, for example, I frequently use a uh, scooter from a uh, scooter fleet to get around. Um, that scooter generates pings as I move through, through the city. Um, and those pings are sh shared with not just the scooter operator um, and are accessible to me as well um, through its interface, but are also shared with the city that, that has a legitimate interest in governing the roadways and understanding how these uh, these scooters are used and understanding transpa transportation demand. 
Um, but at the same time, the very fact that the city knows what I'm doing means they could trace uh, my movements to a protest, for example. Um, the fact that uh, the um, that Lime, the scooters company that I'm that I use, has this data makes it hard for other um, companies to enter the market. So the city might want to actually share that data uh, that Lime has collected um, in order to create a more vibrant scooter market. Um, and uh, you know, at the same time, I might want to take my data and move it to another company so they can understand my needs and better serve me. So there's a lot of different interests. You can think about different settings in which these interests conflict and that we need to think about how to balance them and make them more compatible. Um, and the third one is just the speed and complexity of data has really outstripped our current tools um, like, like um, de-identification and anonymization, like consent, uh, and even like the very important, very powerful open data movement. The set of tools that we really have is, I think, outdated and outmoded, and we need to think about how to upgrade them while building on the strengths of what we already have. Um, and then finally, I'm really excited, not just for today's conversation, but for tomorrow's conversation, um, I think there's kind of three sets of tools that we need to be thinking about. One is legal. Um, the second is institutional, things like data collectives, data trusts, um, et cetera, uh, that can help us manage this. And the third is technical. Um, there are tools like federated learning, um, like uh, homomorphic encryption, et cetera, that we need to be thinking about. And we need to be aligning legal, institutional, and technical um, approaches so that they work together and uh, make this possible. Uh, so again, thank you. It's an incredibly important discussion. It's how we deal with these governance issues is going to shape how we govern AI, and it's going to uh, shape the structure of not just our um, domestic markets, but also international competition and, and hopefully cooperation. Um, so this is a crucially important conversation, um, not just in the region, but uh, around the world, and I, I'm super excited to learn. Phenomenal. Thank you, Kevin. And apart from uh, sharing the very private details of your scooter and how you move around town, but so now you know where to find Kevin or how to locate him, actually. <laughs> but on a serious note, um, I think one of the many interesting questions for an organization like ours, and I'm very curious to compare notes with everybody else, is that in both the areas that you're mentioning in terms of governance frameworks and the tools that you're indicated, uh, how do we actually keep up uh, with a conversation that moves, as you said, at a speed often on the outside, much greater when we're on the speed on the inside? Uh, and how do we actually play a, a convening role or, or a role where we can actually are credible players when uh, uh, we are struggling ourselves to make sense of all these many different trends, many new things coming up and the particularly complex intersection or some of the things that you're mentioning <clears throat> in terms of when it comes to how the factors come in interplay, right? Who's taking decisions uh, around some of these tools? How do we actually first play a role in that? I think these are questions that are very much on, on the top of our minds. So thank you for setting the scene really beautifully for us. Uh, and then uh, now we move on to, to Jessica who among many other things has also been exploring uh, governance mechanism, not only from a theoretical perspective, but also how do we move from theory into practice? And one of the questions that we keep asking ourselves as, a, as an organization is how do we move beyond generic guidelines, toolkits, et cetera, to actually exploring the dilemmas in uh, the real world. So very, uh, Curious to learn from your experience, Jessica, and uh, what you can tell us about data trusts and beyond. Thank you, Julio, and thank you to the UNDP team for organizing today's session. I was really interested to hear the discussion and to hear the discussions that come in the subsequent sessions, because this question of what practical steps do we need to take is really the crucial one to move forward current data governance debates. I'm just going to take a moment to, to share my screen. And hopefully you all, you all have that now. Um, 
So yes, I, I want to share a few thoughts about how some of the, the trends Kevin spoke, spoke about factor into our thinking of the Data Trusts initiative, which is a new collaboration between the Cambridge Computer Lab and the University of Birmingham that is trying to address this question about how do we move from, from principles to practice in data governance. And building on what Kevin was saying, there's been a real shift in the narrative around the, the digital world over the last 30 years. So technologists used to talk about the Wild West as if the internet was an ungovernable space where, where governments weren't invited or weren't able to take action. And in some ways that freedom to innovate, that freedom to collaborate had real benefits. We've got a whole range of digital products and services today that we didn't have previously because of that freedom. But at the same time, over the last five years, we've been seeing these new forms of harm emerge, whether that's individuals finding that personal data about them is being used in ways they hadn't anticipated, or groups that were already disenfranchised in society finding themselves further discriminated against in the digital environment. And at the same time, we're grappling with these wider questions about how does, this, how does society want to use digital technologies and what are the implications on how we relate to each other, both individually and at a wider social level. But at the same time as seeing those harms, we're also seeing a real desire to find these practical policy solutions, whether that's regulators issuing fines against specific data governance breaches, um, industry advisory boards publishing ethics principles or data governance guidelines or policymakers developing their national AI and data strategies. Now, all of these different types of intervention point to data governance as the territory in which we'll, we're thinking about how to build the social values, the things that we value as a society into the technologies we develop and how we assert our fundamental rights in that process. Now, existing legislative frameworks already create a constellation of different data rights and responsibilities whether that's IP, copyright, personal data, privacy and security. And we have tools to be able to implement some of those rights, whether that's, as Kevin was saying, the, the technology, the codes of practice or professional standards and behaviours that govern how organisations use data, or the legal mechanisms and the institutional interventions. The challenge now is to join the dots between these different types of intervention to create a data governance system that's trustworthy and that represents all of our interests. Now thinking about those different types of legal mechanism, over the last few years we've seen a variety of different types of stewardship model emerge. So that might be kind of contractual frameworks or that govern the ways that organisations share data between them. It might be data commons where researchers pool their data for, for common use. It might be co-ops where communities come together to define common, common use of data. Public data banks that steward data for a public policy outcome. Or data trusts, which I'll, I'll come back to shortly. The thing about the, the, the frameworks we have at the moment is they've allowed us to do a lot and a lot of good, whether that's um, improving products and services, pursuing public policy goals, but what they've been less effective at is protecting us against those vulnerabilities or really giving individuals and groups a sense of agency in the digital environment and a sense of, of control or influence about how data about them is used. And one of the tensions we've seen come up in data governance debates is around these notions of control and ownership and what it means to what those terms really mean in the 21st century. Because as Kevin was saying, data becomes valuable in aggregate. Um, data about me as an individual is not so interesting, but when it's combined with many other people's personal data, it can be a source of significant social and economic power. And an environment where only a small number of organizations or ac actors have access to that data is one of asymmetric power. Any individual alone is not well placed to seek to influence the terms of, of use or to negotiate terms of use around their personal data. Now, in those conditions of asymmetric power, history gives us examples of the power of collective action in helping individuals and groups take back their rights. So the picture here is of the 1832 Reform Act, which in the UK gave the vote to freeholders of land. So if you're a landowner, you were able to vote. But obviously that excluded a huge amount of people in society. So what people began to do is to band together in land societies and collectively purchase plots of land, and in so doing, each of the landowners gained the right to vote. 
And it's inspired by some of these examples that we've been thinking about data trusts as a, a new form of data governance. Now, trust law has a long history in the UK um, where it's been used to, to steward an asset. So a trustee is tasked with managing an asset on behalf of another individual for a specific purpose. Um, but there are equivalent frameworks or complementary frameworks that could be used across the world. Now, the idea behind a data trust is that individuals would be able to pool their data rights or their data into a single organization where they would task a trustee with determining terms of data use on their behalf. That trustee, because of the, the safeguards put in place by trust law, would be required to act with a fiduciary responsibility. They would need to, to steward that data in, terms of, in line with the terms of the trust, which would be determined by the members of that trust. That trustee having access to this aggregated data would be better placed than any individual alone to enter into those negotiations with data controllers about how and where data should be used. Now our hope for data trusts is these offer a route for communities, groups and individuals to better exert their agency in the digital environment, filling those gaps we see at the moment around how meaningful is consent when we're talking about data use. Or what do we do in an environment where any individual active data exchange might seem trivial, but taken together over time, people are, be, are able to create a detailed picture of our lives and activities in ways that we might not feel comfortable with. And so it's thinking about how we move from theory to practice in data trust that we've established the data trust initiative. Because while there has been a lot of interest from policymakers across the world in data trusts over the last couple of years, there's still a, a huge range of questions to address if we're going to make these happen to, to address real world challenges. And those questions range from what rights do we have in different situations over different types of data? Do we really understand the boundaries of our current rights and responsibilities? How can we make data trusts that serve all in society and make them truly inclusive as an, ende as an endeavor? What about finance and sustainability? What business models need to underpin data trusts if they're going to be sustainable and last over the long term? And what are the other factors that are going to make a data trust trustworthy? What wider forms of safeguards or accountability might need to be in place? Um, so as I say, there's a lot to work through, which is why I'm so pleased to see this series begin to, to grapple with some of these questions. Um, because this, this won't be one initiative alone, but is able to take on this full range of challenges. There's a whole range of different parties that need to be involved in these conversations. And with that, I'll pause and hand back to Julia. Fantastic. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, thank you also for throwing the challenge <laughs> at all of us to actually not only move from theory to practice, but actually explore uh, different modalities and see what actually can we learn from each other. Uh, I am still struck by the contrast between this long history that Kevin made us with of a census and all of this uh, and how uh, we're still struggling uh, to grapple with some of these questions. And yes, technology and all the new movements and the new uh, trends that Kevin has highlighted has brought us, and you have highlighted, has brought us this completely new set of questions. Uh, and we are really uh, struggling to find even a common vocabulary to talk about some of these things. And I think some of the metaphors that we're using when we're talking about data show us that we're still grappling with some of the, uh, some of these issues and i thought really quite interestingly how you uh, talked about governance but then you also talked quite a lot about stewardship uh, maybe not not now but then i think hopefully in the q a question we can start talking about some of these nuances which i think again start speaking about uh, how we, we need to develop literally vocabulary to actually build a common mind, uh, understanding of what we mean by these things. And obviously the best way to do it is actually by doing and testing things out in reality. So thank you very much for that. Uh, last but not least, uh, I'll uh, hand over to Sushant. And, uh, and uh, one of the things that I uh, really hope he's going to <laughs> help us unpack uh, is a question that I think is dear to his heart is, how do we actually uh, shape these conversations, these models, these frameworks, these tools towards equitable outcomes? 
uh, and how do we build a, a, an equitable data economy? And obviously this is something that uh, for us as a development organization is one of the fundamental questions that we are asking ourselves. Uh, so Sushant, once again, we hope you have all the magic answers for us. Over to you. Indeed, thank you, Julio. I have uh, all the answers as you're expecting, or clearly not. Um, inspired by uh, my co-presenters, I'll share some slides. But before I begin, just uh, wanted to start with a thank you to uh, the Rockefeller Foundation uh, and to UNDP for organizing this. And this has uh, been uh, inspiring, thought-provoking presentations from Kevin and Jessica. Uh, I will begin with sharing my screen. So as uh, Julia was talking about uh, metaphors and how do we even begin to think about the vocabulary around data, data governance, what is data has been uh, a challenge. And what it has seen emerge is various characterizations of what data is. The most famous and the least useful of that is calling data as uh, oil, uh, further uh, establishing the, uh, the extractive nature of the data governance. I, I just want to call out the two specific aspects of it. Data, uh, the unique nature of data is such that when we start to think about the value of data, we get to an entirely different set of um, metaphors. You start to think of data as a resource. When we start to think about the risks or the harms that it entails, you, the metaphors that you use are entirely different. You start thinking about carbon dioxide or other externalities like sewage, and some, some have also called it poison, uh, given the harms and the risks that can come out of it. And as Kevin was eloquently talking about it as well, it has tremendous value, but at the same time, there are risks that need to be uh, safeguarded. As far as Omidyar network is concerned, we uh, uh, believe that technology and data is a force for good. And we want to make sure, uh, ensure we find ways in which we can mitigate the harms, but at the same time also act as a catalyst to, uh, to, to ensure the value of data for society, for individuals can be maximized. So to begin with uh, characterizing the issue, uh, our hypothesis uh, with, with a fair degree of evidence is that the data economy is not equitable for all stakeholders. It mirrors the current capitalism that we have where shareholder value maximization is the primary objective and the other stakeholders have not seen the fair share of their value accrue to them. And who are these other stakeholders? They're consumers or the citizens uh, who have become in this free business model who have become the product. Um, there are there is there are countries which are the different jurisdictions which is another stakeholder where tax avoidance by uh, big tech players uh, has led to a situation where the value that should come from the data economy does not get accrued to the to the particular jurisdiction and that's a, a separate matter altogether there are there are uh, gig workers who are part of the platforms sure they get employment but uh, the data that gig workers contribute to the platform sometimes are used against them to ensure that uh, you know the wages are kept low and uh, 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 you know the the working conditions are have, have not been able to improve and that's sort of the uh, not the unfair uh, bargain in this uh, uh, data economy uh, the small businesses who sell products on the platforms uh, sure they get access to the markets and uh, reduced friction but at the same time, uh, they are also at the risk of being edged out in this data economy by their data being utilized by large horizontal platforms by, uh, for selling similar services. So that's the hypothesis that we begin with. So what can we do about it? Starting to think about the, uh, the left side here where we say, you know, personalized experience, where to some extent Google at some point started talking about uh, uh, how can we utilize data analytics to the extent that we can think the thought before you do. And that uh, might be a challenging and worthwhile data analytics problem, 
but is extremely, extremely uh, uh, problematic as, as far as privacy and civil rights are concerned. So in terms of thinking about characterizing it, we wanted to put together an understanding of uh, what metaphors will start to get us towards uh, not just characterization, but then norm setting and thinking about regulations around data. Should we characterize it as a bundle of rights instead of saying it's gold or sunlight and whatnot? What levers for change do we have for, for the data economy? And what are the mechanisms in which value is being created and distributed in this data economy? Now, these were the theoretical questions and we wanted to test it with uh, uh, practical experiments as well. So we start thinking about what are these specific tools such as incentives in the market design, uh, the frameworks for individual and collective data rights, some of which uh, get spoken about as uh, you know, the, uh, the framework of stewardship or trusts that we can put in place. And how can we make sure that there is more data available for solving big, uh, hairy challenges? Um, in terms of trying to balance or straddle between the new paradigm or rethinking the global data economy and uh, practical challenges, we've tried to create a, sort of a modular structure where we, uh, on, on one side, we are thinking about evidence on the normative foundation for a fair data economy. What is the right way to think about data, about the value of data, about distribution of data, and what mechanisms such as say advertising tax can promote equitable value. But at the same time, how can we enhance the, uh, uh, you know, how can we unlock value of data for all stakeholders? And that's where the practice of stewardship through various models such as exchanges, data trusts, et cetera, uh, come into play. Now, having characterized the problem, I want to spend a minute on how are we thinking about, uh, I know out of, I'm out of time that was allocated to me. I'll take just a minute more. Um, so we are in the phase in the data economy where in the international relations, you would characterize as norms emergence. Uh, and the norms that are emerging are related to data are starting to converge from different parts of the world. And to take a perspective of the global south as well, there's a, a, a movement around both data stewardship as well as characterization of non-personal data that has begun in India as well. So in terms of what norms are, being, are, are getting shaped uh, as of today, I, I want to call out an important element which I believe uh, some of the advanced markets are playing catch up on uh, is thinking about data, not just as only personal data, but as a comprehensive whole of including personal data and non-personal data, which Europe has now characterized as industrial data. And that then begins to uh, talk about a, a whole new set of issues around how we can uh, maximize value for the society as well as protect the interests of businesses uh, at the same time. The second, uh, I think, is around when we spoke about public data or uh, industrial data or non-personal data, the only framing we had was around uh, open data. And from that, I think there is a move towards responsibly stewarding the data as to how can we make sure that there are mechanisms for safeguards uh, in place, which, which I think is, is, is a norm that is getting shaped in Europe or, and, and strongly supported by of the demand as well as uh, discourse in uh, the global south. The third, I think, is around uh, the nature of data itself. There's a recognition that from just an individual nature of data, like data about me is just about me, we are starting to move towards a, a more of a recognition and realization that we need to account for the relational nature of data the community oriented nature of data. And that goes on to both the rights as well as how we utilize data for communities benefit, for individuals benefit and for society's benefit. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, close my remarks by saying, you know, the norms are getting shaped. Global South 
the resource is, is, is rich, uh, it's contributing step in step and together with uh, uh, the, the, the discourse in, in Europe. In terms of a fair data economy uh, and building towards that, it's important to understand uh, and shape some of these norms around data in terms of how value is created, how value is extracted, and how value is distributed across different stakeholders uh, in, in, of the data economy. I'll pause at that, Julio, and hand it back to you. Phenomenal. Uh, thank you, Shant. Even though you didn't have all the magic answers, uh, we we're very disappointed. But uh, you actually um, really uh, brought us back to a number of different important dimensions as far as, as we're concerned, which is uh, not only the language, but then how these new norms are being shaped and how these norms are being shaped in different ways uh, around the world. Which I think is something that we definitely want to to reflect on. I, uh, you probably have seen it. VFT had a, a, an op-ed I think last week where we're basically saying there's uh, free data zones in the world, right? Where is the US? Where is Europe? Where is China? Everybody else is pretty much uh, uh, trying to find their way. Uh, and and I'm wondering whether this is a perspective we would want to you know we would share and agree, or actually whether it's just that we are not seeing. As you're seeing, uh, as you're saying, you know, movement from the south it is actually bringing a, a very different type of perspective. I also think that uh, the taxonomy of data that uh, you started unpacking towards the end, again, just gives us a sense of how you know something which is we thought we were super familiar with, like data, is generating all sorts of uh, different new questions when we started looking at the lens of what uh, new technologies, new uses of this data have raised for us. Let me just go it here for one second before we open up to Q&A. Uh, one uh, uh, quote from Trisha Wang that uh, has written this, this uh, beautiful article on uh, what we mean by personal data. Uh, and she's that the data doesn't just belong to you in the way that your house or your car might, it is also you. It's like a quantum particle that can exist in two places at the same time, as both a representation of who you are and a commodity that can be sold. Uh, and I think whether you like or not this distinction, but I think this is exactly this type of ambiguities, right? That we are grappling with uh, of really where to put boundaries around this notion, which we thought we knew so well because of a history of a census and all these other things. And all of a sudden we started even asking what is individual data, right? What is community data, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's, a, it's in a sense, it's a very exciting moment, but I obviously, um, all these questions are also generating lots of anxiety and there's also very practical implication for people on the ground. So enough of me. Uh, I think uh, I will encourage colleagues uh, and uh, uh, whoever is in the audience to please start sharing uh, questions. Uh, and I think that uh, I can see that we are already having one uh, which touches upon this multinational uh, dimension. So I hope you can see all the Q&A, but I'll read it out. It's uh, beyond national frameworks, is there a role for multilateralism in uh, data governance? Who wants to take this? Easy peasy question. Yeah. I'll, I'll take a first stab and then uh, target Jessica and, and, and Shusan. So I, I think the answer to this is clearly yes, uh, there is room, there should be room, and there has to be room. Um, as we know uh, very well, data doesn't stay within borders, um, uh, even, even more so than people it moves across borders, um, uh, despite whatever laws you throw up or et cetera. So there, there has to be international dialogue and I think there has to be, uh, uh, we would all be better off if there is cooperation. Um, and certainly the, um, the forthcoming um, uh, World Bank World Development Report lays out some thoughts on this. Um, the uh, UN uh, Commission on Digital Cooperation ha has put uh, together some, some um, provocative ideas. Um, and the, but I think for right now, the challenge is that, that um, you know, there aren't even just three uh, uh, sort of blocks of data governance. Um, it, even in China, Europe, 
uh, the US, California, which is its entirely different um, jurisdiction for right now, um, we don't know what the data governance looks like. And we're, we're all sort of creeping along um, and figuring this out and testing the boundaries and figuring out where the boundaries are. Um, and it's tough to have a, 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 um, a dialogue with, uh, in, in that way. Um, but what would really help is developing better institutions that can have these dialogues. So people in government, people around government, civil society, who can really um, bring a good sense of what data means, um, who can understand the values embodied in da data um, and can have these international conversations. And I'd love to see more investment in those types of institutions, both in government and outside of government and those type of people. I think I would Obvious. just uh, yeah. go ahead. I would just add a second everything Kevin has said, and maybe just add to it um, two, two two areas where I can see multilateralism having a, a particular benefit. One, Julia, exactly as you were saying, was around sharing the norms that are emerging, sharing the framings of data governance challenges that are emerging because we don't fully understand, understand the scope of the challenge at the moment. And having those conversations with a variety of different perspectives that can help us kind of kick the tires on different data stewardship methods is very helpful. And um, the second is around the set of common challenges we know exist for, for all across the globe, articulated through the sustainable development goals, but also through different frameworks where we know there are priority areas where we want to take action to use data to benefit all in society. And it seems that there's a role there for us to, to come together and discuss how we can tangibly take forward those challenges in a data enabled way. Yeah. Uh, Julia, I wanted to add to this. I think uh, short answer is there's a lot that a uh, uh, lot of role uh, that can be played by this multilateralism. Um, the reasons, uh, as called out by Kevin and Jessica, are that the challenges there are, uh, there's a there's a thick stack of common challenges that the world is facing, and uh, of course, as the norms get shaped around the civil rights, around uh, uh, you know shaping of data governance, around tools of practice as well, it would be useful for cross pollination and learning. Um, at the same time, I feel. Uh, in the global south, uh, at least of what I've heard from Africa and uh, in India, uh, and uh, the, the, the thinking around being a taker of norms versus a shaper of norms, or, or having a voice at the table in terms of shaping the norms around data governance is important. And what, would, what could be a better platform to give a voice to bring those nuances from these parts of uh, the world, from different cultures where individualism and community orientation in light of data will be seen very differently, where public interest will be seen very differently, where private interests will be seen differently, which practice different models of capitalism in different parts of the world. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, to, to make this equitable, not just as an outcome, but as a process, there is a huge role that can be played. Thanks, Sushant. And I think in some ways your answer already anticipated one of the last questions that we got, which is how do we align incentives around some of this discussion? And I think you're also perhaps more of an incentive is actually uh, power dynamics, right? That you're pointing into uh, and how do we actually make sure that yes, there are platform of conversation, but people have an equal weight and that different discourses are heard. That of course is a, a bigger problem in governance, multilateral governance anyway, even data is probably just exacerbating it. Uh, can I just ask, uh, I'm very curious from a perspective of your different institutions. Uh, so uh, I think um, one of the things that I, COVID has made particular uh, obvious for us is this perpetual anxiety that uh, the issues uh, that uh, data governance raises uh, are constantly moving much faster than we can actually grapple them. And so uh, when governments come to us or communities, et cetera, they want answers, they want them now. 
Uh, and unfortunately, as I think you all pointed out, uh, uh, Jessica, I think you said we cannot even scope a problem quite yet, right? Let alone moving into a, into a solutions. So I'm just uh, very curious from the perspective of your organizations, do you feel the same sense of anxiety? Do you get this type of questions on people that want to see this as uh, black and white and you know there are things that we need to do uh, and and uh, how do you uh, answer this type of anxiety uh, or what do you think we can all do uh, to actually start saying well you know okay it's complex it's moving fast etc but we can preserve a sense of agency for decision makers uh, and decision makers but let's face it often start from a fairly you know behind in any way in, under in uh, understanding and knowledge of technology and data uh, so I'm, I'm just curious if you feel the same <laughs> type of uh, zeitgeist that we are feeling so one of the things I think we've seen in recent months, and I'm referring here to some, some work done um, with the, the Royal Society called the Delve Project, which was about using data evaluation and machine learning in COVID-19 response. One of the things we've really seen over the last year is just how much work there is to do alone in fixing the fundamentals of, of data governance. So going to the basics of do we know what data is out there that can help address a problem? Can we access it? Do we have the skills to put in place those agreements and make use of that data? There's a whole set of those foundational challenges that we're trying to address at the same time as we're running ahead and trying to create these new institutions that can grapple with the forefront of the, of the data governance debate. And that's one of the tensions in the, in the policy landscape at the moment around how, how much should governments be investing in those fundamentals whilst also trying to, to do the, the newer and more advanced data governance approaches. I, I would like to second that and uh, very strongly second that. And the fundamentals, um, and, and even in the times of COVID and in data governance, I think the challenges remain similar. And some of the fundamentals that have been shaped have, uh, have kind of uh, stood the test of uh, this pandemic. Uh, let me explain why. At least when we had the pandemic and then a pandemic of contact tracing apps uh, across the world, um, we did have some fundamentals to go back to in terms of creating parameters of testing, whether they are respective of civil, civil liberties or not. For example, purpose limitation, open source, or data minimization, all of these have been, had, did shape over a long time, where went through this whole process of norm shaping, of creating regulation if GDPR had the, uh, the, the, the lighthouse effect and did hold us in good stead during the pandemic when, you know, whether it was the Indian government or the UK government or the Singapore government, we were able to compare each of these contact tracing apps on, uh, and, and scrutinize them. And that's just a sing, sim, uh, small example for that. And, and, and the second, I, second thing I wanted to call out was uh, there will be a lot that will evolve. Like, from facial recognition to emotional recognition to uh, uh, to uh, you know deep fakes uh, to GPT three being able to write reviews of your movies and and whatnot, uh, things will change and things will evolve. But these foundational values norms that will shape the regulations, I think, should hold us in good stead going forward. I think we are in a shape where these norms are just emerging and uh, uh, have and I'll be an optimist that they're they are uh, helping us shape these institutions and uh, the regulatory structures that we need going forward I, I want to emphasize something that uh, uh, that Sushant I, I think alluded to in talking about the COVID apps and the contract tracing apps which is that it's it's easier for policymakers and those of us in the social sector who are worried about this to um, Change, uh, change the norms and the practices around uh, new things. It's going to be very hard to change entrenched industries like social media um, that provoke a lot of uh, a lot of the um, the anxiety. Um, uh, not to say we shouldn't do it or that it doesn't need to happen, but it, it's going to be far more difficult. 
Um, but for things like contract tracing apps or um, uh, whatever the next thing is, um, that groundwork and those structures are being laid down now. Uh, and so there's an opportunity to think through, through what we want from them and what we don't want from them as they go into place. Um, and there's a tool that I think uh, public, publicly minded people can think about, which is um, not just regulation and, and laws and sort of legal approaches, but actually uh, thinking about what are the, pro uh, the public um, or nonprofit structures um, that we want to take these on. Uh, for example, we've supported a, a, a group called the Commons Project. Um, which is, is really um, a, about kind of doing some of the things that tech companies do, but doing it in a nonprofit structure. Um, so they have developed an app that you'll use to sort of consolidate your health data um, and, and analyze it. Um, that app is now being used to uh, do um, sort of vaccine uh, confirmation and COVID testing confirmation. Um, so super sensitive data. Um, really difficult questions. Um, we'd rather that be handed, handled by an organization that doesn't have a profit motive um, than one that does. It's not a complete answer. It's not a perfect answer, um, but at least allows us to sort of get out ahead of the problem and think about what are the organizations and institutions we do want managing these, these types of infrastructure um, uh, so we can do it ahead of uh, them being laid down rather than after. Thank you, Kevin. This reminds me of one of the examples that we use all the time from, from yeah, and I go back to COVID, is a massive contract tracing apps. When the Singapore government uh, put forward its contract tracing app, it did with a blog post saying, this is not a panacea. And by the way, Google and Apple, we are not going to abide to your rules because we actually understand the health systems like you don't. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I fought for, uh, for a government that is usually quite, uh, Moderate in its statements is actually quite a powerful thing in terms of actually doing that. But I think that points exactly to the point you're saying, who's taking these decisions, where these decisions are taken, uh, and how do we actually support uh, uh, decision-making that is actually not purely driven by, by a profit uh, motive. Uh, which leads me to a question I can see Svet has put on the chat. I hope you can all see it. Uh, which goes back to uh, uh, extractive practices of multinational corporations, increasing equality, uh, discrimination, violation in privacy. How can uh, soft instruments like norms and trusts uh, adequately address such a mammoth challenge? Uh, and I guess the question is, can they really, uh, in some ways, uh, counterbalance the uh, power of multinational corporations? Maybe Jessica, we'll start from you, since I think uh, trusts. And I think the, the short answer there is no one intervention alone is going to. Um, so when we think about data governance as this broad collection of different types of legislation and policy skills and, and norms and behaviors, professional codes of, front, of contact, then legal mechanisms for data sharing like trusts. We need interventions across this whole spectrum of data governance from kind of changes in, in competition policy to um, changes in legis legis legislative frameworks around data rights to skills for data trustees to be able to intervene. There's a whole spectrum of different interventions that would be needed to tackle the breadth of that challenge. There isn't one alone. That, that can address it. And I think that speaks to your, your earlier question around when we're talking about data governance, when we're talking about data stewardship, do we have a sense of what we mean? And I think Shushant had a, alluded to this in his talk when you know, stewardship is tying something to an application or, or challenge. It's the act of looking at what's out there in terms of governance tools and saying, how do we use those tools to address the challenge we face? And that's the space we're in at the moment in making that transition. I uh, terrific answer by Jessica, who's, who's the um, the expert on this. But I, I, I also think there's a missing piece as we think about data institutions, which is what is the value we get out of them. Um, there, there is clearly going to be long-term societal value in terms of privacy protection, in terms of agency over data, uh, in terms of collective action. But um, when you think about why I hand my data over to Google. Um, 
or, um, and this is applicable to anybody um, really in the world, uh, it's because I get something back. I get a really nice in email interface um, uh, or you know, whoever your provider of choice is. Um, so uh, in order for data institutions um, to really take off, I think they need to develop, deliver a compelling value proposition um, either to their uh, sort of individual clients or to governments or to other organizations um, so that we, we have a reason to, to give them the data other than some of the, um, uh, you know, the esoteric reasons um, that uh, maybe the people in this room care about, but um, a lot of us have a hard time caring about in our day-to-day -day life. Um, my, myself included. I happen to think that data monetization is not that value proposition, by the way, but we can think about what other, uh, you know, what other benefits, um, like getting uh, information about what crop, what disease your crop has, um, that people would, might get back from sharing their data. Sushant, did you want to jump in? Yeah, so uh, I understood the question in terms of uh, how are there needs for need for more hard instruments for uh, addressing some of these mammoth challenges. My short answer is yes, uh, and and to that end, uh, regulation is uh, is is uh, imminent and uh, is is one of the uh, answers, one of the uh, I guess tools in the kit for. Uh, tackling some of these challenges, but regulations will follow after the norms that a society uh, builds for itself. It also expect, it also reflects the expectation that a society or a country has, or the world has of the tech players of the platforms of how data is, uh, uh, data is exchanged, how, how data is used for public good. So I think these softer uh, aspects around uh, norms and uh, trusts will set the moral compass or the North Star, but at the end of the day, you will have to come up with uh, regulation, with tools or intermediation tools that intermediaries, uh, which have fiduciary responsibilities, figure out the legislative framework in each jurisdiction that allows for a data trust to thrive, for example. Fabulous, thank you. And this also, again, brings us back to, to a question that for us, at least, we will be asking, which is, does this particular area require a different type of way of thinking about regulation, partially because of the, of the speed, the complexity of the thing, is the way we think about regulation now really uh, adequate with the challenges that data is throwing back at us, uh, which again, is a topic for another <laughs> webinar, I'm sure. Uh, we're coming close to the end, so uh, I wanted maybe just to, for, for uh, rather than wrapping up, uh, ending one from one, uh, uh, getting your perspective one each, if you were to make uh, one bet uh, into one area where you really think we need to deepen our understanding and practice as fast as we can when it comes to uh, data governance, uh, and I assume, you know, from either from perspective from a founder or a researcher, you put quite a lot <laughs> into this thinking. I throw it back at us. Tell us what would be your bet? Uh, where would you put your bet? Where should we actually really focus on to advance the conversation? And you can only pick one and make it very difficult for you. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, I think. Uh... I would go very narrow and uh, start with uh, something that's less um, sensitive. So I would pick up the space of mobility and uh, do two things. One, to understand public value in terms of uh, uh, both the value that can be generated uh, from mobility for the society and also understand the tools that can help us generate that. For example, what kind of a regulation will unlock all mobility data, which will make sure our traffic is smooth uh, to begin with? And how can we pool uh, mobility data from individuals, which is not, which is anonymized and things like that. So essentially pick up this one particular sector and make it an experiential learning, uh, shaping of norms and shaping of regulations uh, to an extent that one day I would hope to see 
that every city mandates that anyone providing public transport should share data to improve public transport within that city. That would be my bet and that is what I would uh, work towards. Sushant has just fixed my scooter problem, uh, so 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 thank you. Um, and and I I, I, uh, I I'm kind of inclined to agree with you, Sushant. Uh, but I, so I think my one place would be uh, data stewardship as a practice, um, and uh, you know maybe more specifically, uh, I think the pandemic has uh, caused us to uh, has created some focus on how we think about health data. Um, that the signals of um, disease spread, of disease outbreaks, et cetera, um, are, we, we've seen that we need those. We need to understand um, health, not just as an individual thing, um, or even as a, a city or a neighborhood, but as a globe. And so how we balance um, you know, the critical importance of individual privacy, the critical importance of national um, sovereignty, of tribal sovereignty, um, with uh, you know the global need to work together uh, to combat disease has has massive implications for how we think about health data as our health systems increasingly digitize everywhere. And in an, in an attempt to, to draw those two together, I'm going to go for something that's slightly cross-cutting in terms of um, one of the things that ties all these applications together is the need to engage with citizens, to engage with people about how they want their data to be used. So what toolkits can we create that is going to help people do that participatory engagement, to do that co-design and to think about what, what forms of data access and use they want to create in future? Phenomenal. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, I think you set an agenda for us for the next uh, millennium, at least, um, uh, and certainly set up a, a beautiful scene for tomorrow's conversation um, when we are going to look at the uh, emerging example from practice. So let me thank you once again, not only for sharing uh, uh, your expertise, for provoking us, but also for really accepting the spirit of these conversations, which is really to start opening up a dialogue and being open to the fact that we don't have all the answers, but probably many more questions at this point in time, but actually only by sharing and continuing this type of dialogues can we advance uh, the conversation and our collective understanding. So thank you for being so generous with your insights and your time. Thank you for all of you who joined us. Uh, I'm sorry we were not able to go through, through all the questions, um, but I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Thank you and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.